This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Frankie McCamley in Scotland to find out how plastic is being used to build recycled roads. And I'm Emma Keeling in central London where a company is harvesting insects which they say could revolutionise farming and help the planet. And I'm Shinny Somara finding out about drone photogrammetry and how it can help us understand the migration patterns of grey whales. around the world, around 5 trillion single-use plastic bags are used, and every minute, around a million plastic bottles are purchased. And half of all of that plastic that's produced is designed to be used just once and then thrown away. But what if, instead of being incinerated or thrown into landfill, plastic could be used to build roads, like the one I'm driving on? I'm Frankie McCamley and I'm in Lockerbie in Scotland to find out about recycled roads. Motivated by the plastic epidemic and the poor condition of some UK roads, three friends had a brainwave. Toby McCartney founded McReba, the plastic road company, with partners Gordon Reid and Nick Burnett. This is the first plastic road to go down anywhere in the world, and you've just driven on it. Um, wow. You'll notice there's no potholes in it. <laughs> I <laughs> did not it? spot a pothole. No, no potholes. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it looks, it looks just like any other road. It's not bouncy, it looks exactly the same. It does exactly the same as any other road, but yeah, no. there's plastic contained within this mix of asphalt that's produced to, to form the road. How did you come up with this idea? Wow. I remembered something that I'd seen in India where what they were doing is they were employing people as pickers and they would go and pick out various items of litter, plastic litter. They would stick it into potholes, pour diesel all over it, set it alight. All the stuff would melt down and form a seal in the hole. So you decided to test this on your own driveway? I knew with limited chemistry background that there must be some genetic code between the plastic which comes from an oil-based compound that's fracked from the ground, as well as bitumen that could get one back to the other. Mm. And so that's what I started to do. The initial test on his driveway six years ago proved successful and the company was formed to commercialise the idea. So welcome to McReva. Thank you. After 18 months of testing and trialling to find a way to safely use plastic in our roads, they found what they think is the perfect recipe. To begin the process of building plastic roads, you need a lot of waste plastic. Luckily, there's no shortage of that. So this is some of the uh, plastics that make up one of our particular mixes. Right, and, and what kind of plastics are we looking at? Where has this all come from? Well, we're looking at various different plastics that go into this, but all of this plastic has come from plastics that can't currently be recycled. So you can see maybe some old bottle tops that are in there. That looks like a bit of a bottle top. Yeah. There's some, um, oh, there's all sorts of different things in there that, well, if we weren't using it, it would be destined for landfill or for incineration. Much of it will end up in our oceans. And, and to me, this looks like a huge amount of plastic, but really, is this just a drop in the ocean? We'll, we'll use this in a couple of days. So, um, you know, for every one mile of road that we put down with our plastics, we're using over one million one-time-use plastic bags in that mix. That's, That's a colossal incredible. amount of waste plastics that we can use up in the roads. How do you get this plastic into our roads? So a road is basically essentially made up of two different things. So you've got your aggregates or your stone, most people would call it, and that's stuck together to make a road with what we call bitumen. That's the black oil. So our plastics are used to replace part of that bitumen that goes into that mix. 
plastic and bitumen both originate from crude oil, which is formed of long-chain hydrocarbon molecules. When distilled in a refinery, the oil is separated into fractions, which are a mix of hydrocarbon chains. One of these fractions, naphtha, is the crucial compound used in plastics. After removing the lighter fractions, the heavier components, including bitumen, fall to the bottom. So this is bitumen here, um, the black sticky stuff that sticks a road together. Um, oh, wow, yeah. And that's the stuff that you would, you would normally drive on or you would walk on if it's a pathway. So that's a bit of road? This is a bit of a road. So <laughs> as you can see, there's no plastic in the road. It's, although we call it a plastic road, yeah. there's no actual plastic in it. The plastic is homogenised in to form a homogenous mix with the bitumen that sticks a stone together. And what plastics do, as an example, is we can make that bitumen more stretchy or we can make it uh, not melt at quite the temperatures that a standard bitumen might melt at. What happens if it rains? We've now got plastic in our roads. Are we going to get microplastics running off into our drainage? It's a really good question, but uh, the answer is absolutely not. There is, there's no microplastics. So as you look at this piece of road, you can see that there's aggregates, you can see that there's bitumen, but that bitumen has formed a homogenous mix with the plastics that have gone into it. So there are no microplastics present to leach off. And of course, every road that goes down, we take leaching tests, we take toxicity tests. We make sure that there's nothing getting out of the road that could be harmful for the environment. As well as monitoring the roads once they've been laid, all the waste plastic sourced has to be a certain type of mix. Cami Lauda is the head of quality control. This is the first place that any samples or incoming materials come to be checked for quality control purposes um, to make sure that the polymers are the right kind of polymers that we need for the tasks that we're trying to do for the product. Um, it's thermal analysis which can include polymer identification, lets us know glass transition points, melt points, um, and just to ensure that it does work within the, the bitumen that will be at the asphalt plant. When Cami says polymers, he's referring to the fact that all plastics are made from polymers or repeating carbon-based molecules. The exact makeup of these polymers affects their melting points. Making asphalt requires heat usually around 180 degrees. All the plastic used is checked to make sure it melts at a temperature lower than this, around 120 degrees, so it homogenises properly without creating microplastics. It's for this reason that they can't use all plastic waste. Well, the materials that we get in, it's all sourced from waste. There's no like virgin polymers involved in it at all. If the polymers that we receive in don't melt and don't do what they need to do within our parameters, then it could cause a major problem with the, the finished product, uh, which in turn means uh, faults with asphalt mixes and customer complaints and so forth, which is obviously what everybody's trying to avoid. Once a batch of plastic has passed quality control, it goes into the mixing stage. Plastic granules are mixed with their commercially sensitive activator, a polymer that helps bind the plastic and bitumen with the aggregate stone. Over 500 polymers were tried before they found the one that worked. After being mixed, the product is bagged and then transported to an asphalt manufacturer near to where the road will be laid. At the asphalt manufacturer, the mix is added in with the bitumen and aggregate and loaded onto the trucks. In the nearby county of Cumbria, in the north of England, a £1.6 million deal was signed to build plastic roads. Other projects are also thinking outside the box to find practical solutions to plastic waste. In 2018, the first plastic bike path was laid in Holland and in Italy, old plastic tyres have been recycled into plastic railway sleepers. As well as the UK, Magriba is shipping their product all around the world, including the US, Turkey, Australia and Bahrain. So this is product ready to go out to wherever the road is being made, to the asphalt manufacturer that will then add it to their asphalt and then the road will be laid from there. 
as best we can. We also produce machinery here so that people can use local waste plastics in local roads and that's really where it's at for us. Would you consider yourself part of the circular economy? Yeah, we're an important part of the circular economy. We're taking the stuff that cannot be recycled currently, forming a new style, a new form of recycling, and then at the end of the lifetime of that road, it can be planed back up, reheated, more waste plastics added to it, and that road goes straight back down as a brand new road. That forms the, the sort of the, the bigger circle of the circular economy with regards to asphalt. So we're just a small part of ending the plastic epidemic, but it's nice to be part of that rather than causing the problems that we, we see around the world today with plastics uh, in our environment and, and everywhere. So I just don't want my daughters to live in a, in a world where there's more plastics in our oceans than fish themselves. It just shouldn't be that way. You can see more of Razor on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more. Just gotta be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. By 2050, the global population is expected to reach almost 10 billion. Demand for food could rise by 60%, further impacting already depleted land and oceans. Just like us, the animals we eat need protein. Around 40% of global crop calories go towards animal feed, with the two main sources coming from fish meal and soy. How can we sustainably meet the world's needs on finite resources while protecting the environment? Flies, bugs and creepy crawlies, we kill them without a second thought. But what if insects are the answer to greater sustainability, deforestation and food shortages? Maybe you should put that fly swat down and come with me. Oh, and I should warn you, you're about to see wriggling, writhing larvae. It's pretty gross. Encycle's mission is a simple one, to sustainably feed the world using the power of insects. Black soldier flies are one of nature's key recyclers. There is no such thing as waste in nature, and with a black soldier fly facility, we take in food waste, convert that into large insects that we turn into protein meal that we can then feed animals and humans sustainably. Hello! <laughs> hello, hello, how are you doing? Hi, I bought my PPE, I'm COVID safe. Is it Karen? Yes, it is. Good to meet you, Karen. Fantastic. Tucked away under the railway arches in London is the R&D office of EntoCycle. Director Karen Whitaker founded the company six years ago. With a background in environmental engineering, he travelled the world as a scuba diver and saw the pressure food production for the human race can have on the environment. There are two main problems with the current food supply chain. One is that countries like the UK are massively dependent upon imports, so about 80 or 90 per cent, and that's of two key protein products, soya meal and fish meal, which we import internationally from the likes of Brazil uh, and South America, such as Chile and Argentina. That means we're placing huge issues on other countries to produce the food for us. COVID has perfectly demonstrated the problem with the supply chain, with food being caught at ports, uh, you know, the timeline between products being delivered has just massively increased. So what we need is hyper-local, sustainable protein production and black soldier flies are one of the key solutions in, to this problem. Matt Hall is the company entomologist or insect expert. Oh, cool little office space. Yeah. And this is the insectary. Uh -huh. This is where we keep all of our insects. Uh, this is where the magic happens. <laughs> I bet. This is your office, Matt. Whoa. What? Is that... Is that the insects? That is nasty. Yeah, so they're eating the food that we're feeding them. So beer grains and coffee are kind of what you're smelling right now, and that's what they're eating That does today. not smell like beer grains and coffee. It's quite acidic, and it smells a little bit like, it smells a little bit like poo. 
Despite the smell, Matt was drawn to EntoCycle's vision, which aligns with how he wants to lead his life. In previous entomology type jobs that I've had, they involved spraying lots of harmful chemicals to try to kill lots of insects in remote parts of the world. And I wanted to sort of keep my work a bit more local and try to solve the, the food waste problem that we're seeing in, in the country that I live in. So the black soldier fly larvae, they're the ones that have to do all the yucky work. They have to eat all the waste. Now, warning, we're about to show them to you and they're very wriggly and a little bit gross. I told you so, but you need to get used to them because they could play a big part in our food future. But anyway, back to the flies. Around 2,000 black soldier flies get on with the business of breeding, which is their sole reason for living. Soon after, they die. We let the flies uh, mate and lay eggs for about six days. You can see the wooden egg traps we have on top of that rotting stuff. Um, that just makes it easy for us to collect the eggs when they do lay them. And did you think about using other insects? I mean, you know, I mean, mealworms are used quite a lot to feed animals, aren't they? Mealworms need uh, dry, high-quality food stock, whereas we can feed these black soldier flies. Um, I mean, they can process any waste from what we feed, which is human food waste. Um, they can eat, uh, eat meat. They can also eat manure and develop um, that way. So we can feed them almost anything and get a high-quality protein source out at the other end. There's no need to tend pastures or grow crops. Food waste is picked up from the local cafes and breweries. Steph Rogers then puts it through a mixer and the final product will be mixed in with the larvae. But like any dad, Matt must wait for the eggs to hatch in the nursery, or cupboard in this case. So 24 to 48 hours after we've taken the eggs, um, they'll hatch out into the food here. So we place them on these hatching platforms. Yeah. If you look closely at this one here, maybe at the end of the mesh, you can see really, really tiny, what we call neonatal larvae, the larvae that have just emerged from the eggs. The black soldier fly, or Hermetia elucens, has a rapid life cycle. Once the eggs have hatched, the larvae live for three to four weeks before they begin to pupate, and two weeks later they emerge as flies. But for protein production, the larvae are harvested and processed after two weeks. Oh, this is it. This is, this is where they just grow. Yeah. In these so, racks. That's right. It's a very sustainable, fast food development with a tiny carbon footprint that can be set up anywhere, which is why the food industry is sniffing about. Right at the beginning, it was quite difficult because the idea of breeding billions of flies, you know, on the, first, on the face of it, looks quite you know, crazy, but actually it's now become mainstream. You know, media are talking about it, supermarkets are engaged with this, feed companies need it. I think COVID and the kind of greater concept of food security has definitely uh, brought this to attention. Um, so we've seen a massive increase in kind of outreach to people who want a more sustainable future for their supply chains. And you know, it's not gonna happen overnight, but the key part here is that we need the technology that enables these facilities to be built. So EnterCycle has focused on that key enabling technology so that we can build hundreds, if not thousands of facilities all around the world. Next year, EnterCycle will build what they hope is the first of many industrial insect protein factories in the UK. Each will contain five to 10 million flies on any given day. So from hatching to um, harvest, the larvae will actually grow about 10,000 times their mass. Those going on to become flies go into the pupa stage, which is like a cocoon. In the opposite way that the larvae are photophobic, they try to burrow away from the light, the flies are actually phototactic, they're attracted to the light. Um, the flies actually don't have uh, the ability to eat or, or gain any energy. All of the energy that the flies have was stored from the larval stage. So we don't want the flies to waste their energy by buzzing around these lights. So we keep them in a dark chamber here yeah. and let them emerge as flies wow, in these containers. Wow, that sound. I mean, that would be really annoying if I was at home, but here it's quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. EnterCycle is planning trials with salmon and is hoping the EU will soon approve trials for chickens. But to satisfy demand in future, they'll need to be delivering 50 to 100 tonnes of insect protein a day. That means perfecting the processes here in the insectary. Each day, Steph harvests eggs from the traps. This is all about standardisation, so making the process the same every single time, every single day, the same process. And so how many eggs does each black soldier fly lay? 
So a female can lay between 600 and 1,200, um, kind of, a, you know, around 600, 800 is normal. Um, but what we care is about the efficiency of getting the majority of the females to mate and lay eggs. So with the same amount of eggs hatching, to have the larvae to eat the same amount of food, to produce the same amount of larvae that will produce the same amount of flies, that will then again produce the same amount of eggs. And so it's all about making that process um, as continuous and as streamlined as possible so that downstream it becomes really easy to produce protein and more flies. So you're talking about scalability there? Exactly, exactly. So standardization is fundamental. It's easy to farm insects badly. It's difficult to farm them well and at scale. And so that's what we do here at EnterCycle. Right, and so this is easily scalable? Yeah, this is fantastically easily scalable. While humans are terrible polluters, nature cleans up its mess. What's being separated here are pupae and the digested waste, also known as frass or poo. Oh, that's one hell of a massage. So, are the pupae all right after? Yeah, the they're absolutely fine after this process. As you can see here, they're all they're still fine and moving. Tell me a bit more about the, the poo. So the insect frass, is, as is what it's known, is essentially the, the, the leftover digesty. Um, we've been running trials with universities that have shown that with about a five to 10% inclusion of our frass, we can have almost 100% larger plants. So I can take something of this for my tomatoes? Yes, you can, oh, small, right. although this is a highly, highly sought after. So uh, we're sending this off to all multiple partners as well as academics. So this is what it's all about. This is the final product. This is whole dried black soldier fly larvae. Wow, they're not very big, are they? So you, do you feed them whole like this? No, the so the gr reality is we dry them and extract a high quality protein flour. So this meal is what we're going into the animal feed pellets to make the high quality protein that they then need to grow. Oh. And so, I mean, can I eat this? Is it safe to eat? Yeah, of course, go for I'm it. I'm gonna give it a try. Oh, it's a little bit crunchy. Oh, it's kind of nutty. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, mean, I mean, this is not for humans. I mean, it could be down the line. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, the, the here and now is to sustainably feed animals, but very much so you can see this baked into pastas or breads or other kind of pro uh, high carbohydrate products where you can get your protein, you know, without harming the planet. Karen is targeting the insects to provide 5 to 20% of fish or animal feed. He says it not only contains the key 12 amino acids that are needed for animals and humans to grow, but it's also hypoallergenic. Reality is the money investment is going there, the government support is going there, and the kind of the interest, just proof in having this conversation with you guys proves that this is going to be one of the key new industries. We won't necessarily need Facebook in 100 years. We will still need to eat, and we'll need to eat sustainably. So this is one of the few companies where I think you, know, you can build a legacy of sustainability and businesses that just do good by default. In the spring of 2019, an unusually high number of grey whales were washed up on the eastern Pacific coast of Mexico, the USA and Canada, either dead or dying. They didn't show any signs of having been caught in fishing nets, nor have biologists found any signs of a toxic spill or outbreak of disease that would account for their deaths. They had simply left their breeding grounds in Mexico and never made it back to their feeding grounds in the Arctic. This was declared an unusual mortality event by NOAA Fisheries in the US, uh, which is an event where a lot, lot of animals are dying and, and critical or urgent action needs to be taken to figure out what's happening. So why were the whales dying? Assistant Professor Frederick Christensen and his team had secured funding in 2017 to study these whales, particularly their migratory patterns, so they were in a unique position to help solve this mystery. We don't know that much about whales and not and like what's called bioenergetics. So it's basically like how much energy do they require to, to function? How much energy does it cost them to grow? How much does it cost to reproduce? and to survive and so on. 
The only way to get this information historically is from whaling records. We had to kill the whales and measure them and measure how much oil they have, how thick their blubber is and so on. Professor Christensen has been using drone technology to measure the bioenergetics of whales in a non-invasive way. So how do the drones work? We just fly this over the whales at maybe 20, 30 meters altitude. It has a camera on it on board that we face directly down in a perfect 90 degree angle. So we can measure from the photographs the number of pixels, that's the length of the whale and the width of the whale. We do this when the whale comes up to the surface to breathe, so you can actually clearly see the whole contour of the animal. And by knowing the altitude and knowing the, the camera focal length, the picture resolution and so on, we can actually convert these pixel measurements to, to actual meters. So we can measure how long the whale is and how wide it is. And from that we can calculate its volume. And by looking at the volume relative to how long the animal is, we get a metrics or kind of an index of how fat the animal is, so its body condition. Most of these species spend half the year feeding in one location, normally close to the polar regions. And then they use all this energy, they build up these fat reserves that they then carry with them on their bodies, in their bodies, uh, to the breeding grounds during the winter. And during that time, they're not feeding at all. So for them, having really a lot of fat is essential for their reproduction and their survival. So to understand how body condition, how you can measure it and how you can relate it to survival and reproduction is fundamental to understand anything about the ecology of this species. The drones allowed for many more whales to be easily monitored from the air than with traditional boat-based techniques. And we can identify the animals from the color patterns on their backs, both from the drone, or if operating from a boat, we can also take pictures of the flank and identify them. So by doing that, we can actually monitor the same individual for as long as they stay in Mexico, basically. We can photograph the same animal over time and measure how its condition changes. Uh, we can see how mothers, for example, are getting thinner, whereas the calves are growing in size and so on. But over the four years of monitoring, something shocking was revealed. We can see a trend in how the population condition changes over the time. All the animals are declining in condition, which would be expected because they're not feeding. But they're declining to a level which is really low before they start heading north. And that level is much lower in 2018 and 19 compared to 2017, which makes me believe that the animals are losing so much condition that they're getting very close to their starvation threshold. And some animals are gonna have passed that threshold and end up dying before they get back to their feeding grounds where they can replenish their energy reserves. So where along their migration routes are they perishing and why? It's uh, on the return journey. So if it's caused by starvation, which our data suggests it is, uh, that would kick in most severely at the end of the season uh, because that will have been the longest period of time that they haven't been feeding. And do you know what's causing this? Because we're seeing this decline is happening even when the whales are arriving in Mexico, something is most likely happening in the feeding grounds. So continued research up there to look at the condition of those animals is the most important, I think. And trying to correlate that with climatic effects and prey availability. Saving these beautiful creatures is part of a much bigger picture of supporting animal populations during unprecedented climate change. Understanding how the Arctic ecosystem is affected by climate change and how this is affecting the prey of the grey whale will be very valuable in itself. From that we can start making predictions of seeing, given different future scenarios, how can we expect the population of grey whales to respond to this? And I think that will then be very important to regulate other things. I mean, we should try to stop climate change, that's for sure, but that's a major challenge.